Well, good afternoon, brothers. Um, I just want to welcome you here. Um, and I, I really have to say, I love this group and I love everybody in this group. And I'm not just saying that. I really do. I mean, God's just given me a heart. Even when Fletch shows up here, you know, I, you know, unannounced, uh, you know, I, you know, my heart just reaches out. Um, but anyway, let me bring you up to date on a couple of things here. Um, first of all, PH Craig, any of you remember him? Um, <laughs> anyway, I, I saw him yesterday. Uh, I think I've told you my wife is his, uh, power, uh, health power of attorney. So she, she does a lot of work with him and, uh, he's just fallen in love with her. <laughs> And um, so we're up there pretty frequently. You know, PH has been uh, in pretty good spirits through all of this. I would say that apparently the, uh, the, the, when he hit his head, it was worse than we thought because now he's being nice and kind and thoughtful. And so, yeah, apparently, apparently he's in a lot more serious trouble than we thought. Um, that could just ruin the rest of his life. Um, but he, um, he, he's not, he, he told me yesterday, he said, you know, really, I have very little pain on my three broken ribs. He said, unless I sneeze or unless I roll over on that side when I'm sleeping, it doesn't even really bother me much, but he, but he's had a horrible situation with this right calf and foot. And part of it was, um, he, I, I think while he was in, you know, he's originally in UNC hospital. Now he's at Carroll Woods and, you know, they took some of his meds away and his, his, um, uh, his diuretic was, uh, so he ended up with his right calf almost tripled in size and, um, he, and he gained a bunch of weight. So, but, but now, um, towards the end of the, uh, his stay at UNC and certainly over at Carroll Woods, he's been up and walking with the walker and he's had PT and, uh, his leg is substantially back down, but he's really, really had a lot of problems with gout. A very, very painful gout. Very painful. One day I was there and he would, every 15 seconds, he would holler, scream out with pain. So, but, um, so that's really the thing that has what worried him the most. And he, and he's hoping that maybe, uh, within this, within the week, they'll let him go home. So I don't know what that's going to mean for me and Terry, but, but anyway, so, um, also John Wells wanted me to point out that the food plate is over here, not where the food is. So if there's anybody would like to donate to the food plate, we actually pay for the food that comes in. So just so you know about that. Okay. That's that. Um, this is a note on caring bridge about Catherine Crot. So I'm just going to read it. Um, after I put my glasses on. Um, okay. Um, this is by Claire Alley. Mom is back at UNC today as the cancer has returned. She found out while she was admitted and has taken some time to pray and make decisions about what's next. Today is her first of three second line chemo treatments, which means they are using different drugs for the recurrence. Her abdomen has been filling up with fluid faster than we would like, and we are hopeful that the chemo will dry things out so that she's more comfortable with breathing and eating. Fatigue has really set in, and mom isn't up to a lot of visiting or talking. This particular combination of drugs is supposed to be pretty rough, and mom asked for prayer that her body be able to tolerate it without side effects or repercussions. We are taking this illness and the process of treatment step by step and ask for prayers that mom for the mom and the rest of us. So not very encouraging. So we know how to pray. We know the one that's in charge. Um, so anyway, um, allow me just to, to open us in prayer and then we'll have our illustrious uh, speaker come forward. So let, let's pray together, brothers. Heavenly Father, um, we know that PH and Catherine are in your hands. We know that you love them and you love every one of us. And Lord, we just lift up Catherine's situation. Um, we know to our understanding it's very dire. And we know that um, some of these um, chemo things can be extremely damaging. 
And so we just ask that your hand would be on her, that she would be comforted, that she would, that she would experience healing, she would re- experience relief, and that she, would, uh, that she would have the healing that you desire for her. We ask for PH to have a, a deliverance from his um, gout problems and for him to be restored to the fullness of his health as well. And um, we just ask that you would bless this time together as brothers and as lovers of our Savior, Jesus. And it's in his beautiful name we pray. Amen. Um, and so the right Reverend uh, Brian Pell, um, I can I just this this better be good because, you know, we we spent money on the balloons. And uh, <laughs> anyway, we're glad you're here. Thanks for coming. All right, all right. <clears throat> Hi, friends. Uh, I have met most of you, but I don't want to take that for granted. Uh, unfortunately for Dick, Dick I gets stuck hearing me teach all the time because uh, uh, we have a Bible study over at Zalia Estates, which is walkable from here. And so some of this stuff's going to sound like old news to him, but for the rest of you, this should be new. Uh, I have been pastoring for over 10 years now. And that has covered uh, a a few different cities, a few different types of churches, uh, includes a few different uh, layers of education. Uh, And and so I've been hanging out with you. I think it's been a year now that I've been hanging out with you guys. And, and 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 I say all of that to say, it really is a privilege and a joy uh, to get to be with you and, and certainly to open up the scriptures with you. Uh, and I just want you to know that. So I'm going to pray real quick as well and ask that God would bless our time uh, and then we'll have some fun together. Uh, Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your kindness to this group. Um, thank you that there are Thank you that this group is really a testament to your ongoing work in Chapel Hill and Carborough and Durham uh, over the course of a long period of time. There there really aren't a ton of existing groups that are followers of Jesus that have kind of stood the test of time in this place. It's tough soil, and yet this group uh, continues. And so we're thankful for that. We're we're thankful for the reminder that you really do continue your work, and I'm grateful to get to be a part of it in a small way. So thank you for the lunch. Thank you that we get to study the scriptures together. Uh, We ask that you would bless it and help us uh, to fight off distraction. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, uh, we're going to read, and I'm going to teach out of a relatively famous text. It's not very many verses out of Matthew chapter 18. But before we do, uh, I want to set the stage for you. I think uh, the central element of what's going on in this text, if we're being honest, if I'm being honest, will probably make us a little bit uncomfortable. And and I think that it should. But to get us moving in that direction, I'd like to tell you about two pastors that have had a profound impact on my life. Interestingly, these two gentlemen were a part of my life during a similar stretch of time, but they could not have been much more different, and their stories end up diverging pretty substantially. The first gentleman, uh, his name was James. James uh, was the pastor of the church that my family attended during the season of life that God saved me, that he drew me in and he transformed my heart. And the second pastor, his name is Eric. He was the pastor of the very first church that I ever worked at. And by now, just for the sake of clarity, I'm at roughly number five on churches that I've helped or worked at. So the very first pastor. So these are the two, James and Eric. The first one, James, was a dynamite. I'm not uh, over-exaggerating. A dynamite preacher uh, who portrayed himself as a man's man. So he was Uh, loudly into Harley Davidson motorcycles. He loved sports. He was a big guy with a big personality. Uh, He even dabbled in hunting and he did not shy away. He had a team of researchers and he did not shy away from 
uh, really forceful and enlightening sermons. He, he got after it pretty good. But, uh, and I, I'm, I, I've got to set this up now, I really liked him for that edge. He brought an edge to his preaching, and it, it drew me in, because I'm not really a hunter. I, I'm, I'm not into motorcycles. So, so we didn't have a lot in common, but I liked the edge. And, and it showed in the results of the church. Uh, that church started uh, right after he got out of seminary with a few people uh, in a living room. Uh, and while I was there, that church had over 14,000 people. Uh, and you might already be able to tell where this is going. But at a church of that size, I didn't get to interact with them a whole lot. But I remember on a couple of occasions, it was just a few occasions when I got to interact with James face to face. And something each time felt a little bit strange to me. On those two occasions, I left the room, my interactions with him, feeling like something was wrong, though I was young, so I couldn't quite articulate it at the time. But he'd been, in those scenes, he'd been unnecessarily forward, even rough, with the people with whom he was interacting. That was James, uh, and I'll come back to him in a second. But Eric, <laughs> Eric couldn't preach his way out of a wet paper bag. Uh, and I love him. Uh, he could not preach. And I had a really hard time with that because that, I was interacting with these two men at the same time. He'd been pastoring at a tiny little church in a tiny little town for years and years, and the church hadn't really grown or shrunk at all. I, I think of the couple of years I was working there. I mean, that church, even on Easter, didn't come close to 100 people. Now, it took me a while as I was interacting with James and I was interacting with Eric because I'm stubborn and I'm a slow learner. But I discovered that the second pastor uh, had eventually won me over and had a far larger impact on my ministry than, than all but possibly one or two other people. I'm going to bring up one of them later. Because in the end, though he certainly wasn't perfect and he could not preach, I saw a real likeness to Jesus. This pastor knew every single person in his church. He knew just about every person in the town. He knew what was happening in their lives, and he was praying for them. He went through life at a healthy pace and went out of his way to care for the people around him. And you would never have heard of his full name if I gave it to you. Whereas the first pastor is a name that it's actually probable that you might, you might have heard of it before. I'm not going to say it, but that church was successful by the metrics we tend to think of. But over the years, his anger and his domineering personality burned too many people. Secret recordings of his outbursts eventually came into the public light and his Financial dealings within the church, it turns out, also weren't always above reproach. And so graciously and thankfully, several years ago now, he was asked to resign. So why is it that I spent so long preferring and sometimes defending the first pastor, James, while being irritated and even embarrassed by the second pastor, Eric? And this question takes us to the heart of the matter of what we're going to be talking about today, which is that our cultural intuitions prioritize uh, the bold, the loud, the charismatic, the successful, but the kingdom unapologetically inverts our instincts. Uh, the kingdom celebrates and protects the vulnerable and the humble. That's, a, that's the deal. And that's ultimately the text we're going to be looking at here in Matthew 18. So contextually, I'm about to read it for you. But contextually, there's been this back and forth up to this point within the, the Gospel of Matthew of partial understanding of who Jesus is. They've, they've tried and they've failed sometimes to get close to what Jesus is and what he's about, and then, and then, and then they're way off. And, and, and so that's where we're at. There's this key moment where they ask a pointed question. And it actually sends Jesus on several chapters worth of teaching. They're, they're far enough away from what he's really about that this question uh, dictates the next, I think it's three chapters, 18, 19, and 20, are all teachings 
that are downstream of the question they ask at the start of Matthew chapter 18. So I'm going to read it now. This is Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. Uh, and for the sake of clarity, I'll be reading out of the ESV in case you notice the distinctions. Here's what it says. It says, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus doubles down. It gets, it gets heavier. Verse five, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. All right. <laughs> Not particularly subtle of Jesus, uh, but this teaching of Jesus is a deliberate move to invert the relational economics of his followers. It's to get it upside down. And since he's the rightful king, that's a lot of what the gospel of Matthew teaches, is that Jesus is the king of a new kingdom. Jesus clearly states here that his kingdom, which has entered the world with his entrance, his kingdom celebrates and protects the vulnerable and the humble. Jesus' words and his way of life celebrates and protects the vulnerable and the humble. And uh, I'm going to be honest with you, and I hope you'll be honest with yourselves uh, today. I personally find this truth incredibly convicting. Personally, I do, because if I'm being honest with myself, <laughs> I think the default posture uh, for me, in me, is to pity and on my best days, empathize with the vulnerable and the humble. But my default posture isn't always what we see here. But I want to, I'm going to break down his argument. So verse 1 again, just for the, what sets this up. Uh, verse 1 says, at, the, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus, and their question is, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So we've got to pause here. We've got to bear the weight of this question. Uh, because there's been some stuff going on behind the scenes. We're one chapter removed from the transfiguration. There's been some stuff where Jesus has pulled Peter, James, and John with him. And so surely there's a little bit of jealousy going on behind the scenes. There's a little bit of arrogance going on behind the scenes. And so they want to know. They've been following him for a while. They want to know who is Jesus's favorite. Or, relatedly, they want to know which one of them is closer to being his ideal follower than the others. And so they approach Jesus and they just, they finally work up the courage to ask that question. And all three gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, have this story and there's slightly different variations to each one, but all of them have a version of this story where the disciples are sort of bickering behind the scenes about who's the greatest, who's the smartest, who's following Jesus the best. And uh, Jesus, in each case, uh, answers it kind of uniquely, but they ask, finally, who, Jesus, is the greatest? Which one of us is doing the best? And that, I think, has got to be one of the most relatable things in the Bible. Because if you are like me at all, then on your car ride on the way home, you will have compared my speaking ability to the other three speakers in this Bible study. You just will. This is in our bones. We do it anytime there's a guest preacher or the backup preacher at our churches. We do it when it's not the worship leader we like. We'll compare and create up a competition. We cannot seem to shake this feeling of comparison and competition. Yet, in Matthew's organization of this gospel, this question sets up, like, this triggers Jesus to have a whole bunch of stuff to say because they are so far off. The degree to which his followers' instinct was backwards drove Jesus to then have to teach a bunch of stuff. So this is one of the more painful biblical truths to American ears. Here it is. Competition and the determination of the greatest is not a universally good thing. It is objectively 
not a universally good thing. And the reason for that is fairly simple. People, meaning me and you and us, we are often broken and evil. So competition and power dynamics are often infected with brokenness and evil because it is in all of us. And those realities are rarely ever neutral. And we know this intellectually, right? I, so we all love college sports here. I, you, that's most of what we talk about during lunch most weeks. Um, and so I'll, I'll just be honest with you. Like uh, the last couple of weeks, I'm really enjoying uh, the, the sort of downfall of Texas A&M's football situation. And the, the reason for that is not because I've got any particular beef with Texas A&M. It's because they, to, to my eye, abused the new name, image, and likeness rules and bought their roster over the last year. And it is blowing up in their faces. And I am enjoying that quite a bit. And it feels like the NCAA now, a lot of their goal is just trying to figure out who's cheating and and trying to keep, stay on top of the competition. And the reason for that is because our motives and our actions in pursuit of competition and in pursuit of power can be broken and they can be evil, hence Texas A&M. And that's what's happening here. The disciples are jockeying for special position and privilege with Jesus. They're arguing with each other about it behind the scenes. And yet, uh, as we already discussed, that very natural human instinct is what set Jesus, it's what set him off. He then has to spend a lot of time course correcting them about how the kingdom really works. And so here's what I, the, so that's already interesting to me, that question uh, and Jesus's you know, long response. But in this text, what's the first thing that Jesus does when they ask it? Notice he doesn't answer. The first thing that he does is he brings a child over. This is really profound. I'm going to read verses two, three, and four again. So they ask, who's the greatest? And verse two, and calling to him a child, Jesus put the child in the midst of them and said, truly, I say to those of you who are here, unless you turn and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so the Gospel of Matthew establishes that Jesus is the one true king ushering in a kingdom, and he's teaching about his kingdom. So when Jesus starts to describe the nature of the kingdom, he tells his listeners something really profound about himself and about his way of life that transforms the people in his kingdom. And to do it, he brings up a child. Uh, and we've got to do a little bit of just a brief bit of history here. Most of you will know this. Many of you have studied the scriptures, but in Jesus's day, in this ancient world, very arguably the most vulnerable people were children, especially little girls, uh, but children in general, in various contexts throughout the ancient world, uh, children uh, were effectively subhuman until they reached the age of accountability, until they grew up into effective members who could apprentice and then become adults. Uh, children were at the low end of the social totem pole. And so Jesus is talking effectively to a group of men who are lobbying to him for position and influence in his kingdom. And Jesus completely inverts their instinct because their instinct, if Jesus was just going to point out a symbol, maybe Jesus brings up a warrior. Or maybe Jesus brings up somebody who's in power. And instead, he brings up one of the most vulnerable people in their context. And he says, my kingdom, this way of life celebrates and protects the vulnerable and the humble. That's what we're about. And for Jesus, it's not just empty rhetoric, right? This is what his life and ministry would go on to reflect. This is how the cross works. The, the essence of the incarnation or, or Jesus, the God man, the essence of it was Jesus, uh, having ultimate power as God and choosing to, in humility, experience the fullness of humanity. And not only that, but to then live as a human and be rejected, tortured, and cast aside. Jesus leverages all his power and all of his influence specifically to meet with and bless the broken and the needy. That's the engine 
that keeps his kingdom moving. It's, it's the God-man using his power in humility for the broken and the needy. And I still find it just especially profound that before saying anything to them, he shows them a child. And so as a pastor, uh, and this is both going to be a pastoral and a personal anecdote, I am convinced, I'm convinced that the large percentage of following Jesus, uh, the, the larger percentage of following Jesus is better caught than it is taught. And I, and look, I'm a preacher. So I am, I am for the preached word. I am for the public reading of the scriptures. I, I, I do that for a living, but at least in my experience, so this is both my personal and pastoral experience. The lessons that have sunk the deepest into my heart were rarely the ones that were spoken. So here's what I mean. The best ways to grow in relationship with Jesus, I'm convinced, and to learn his way of life and to make sense of this vulnerability and humility thing is to be near the humble and the vulnerable in your life and to see that, that, that their lives reshape your lives. That's why I think uh, it's entirely possible, and this is, uh, uh, this is a little bit of a bold statement, but it's entirely possible that the best teachers of the way of Jesus in your life never hold a microphone. It's entirely possible the best teachers of the way of Jesus in your life are your faithful, quiet friend or mentor. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. And that was true in my story. So not long after I left the, the two churches that I mentioned that I started with, the one that I was attending and then the one that I was working at, I, out of college, took a full-time gig at a church in Denver, Colorado. And my housing situation fell through. And then a couple from the church that I had just been hired in, they offered to let me stay with them. And uh, I'm so thankful. God, God's been so kind to me because, like I said, I'm stubborn and I learned slowly. So the lessons that I learned from those pastors, I needed then firsthand. And God took me to this couple. And they are uh, such a delight to my soul. I ended up, of the six years I lived in Denver, I lived with them for two years. And it's not all good. Some of the, some of the influence was bad. They were the ones who taught me how to drink alcohol. Previously, previously I'd been a teetotaler, and, and they taught me how to drink responsibly. But if I'm being honest with you, there is no, and this is not an exaggeration. There is no pastor, no theologian, no podcast, no book that has shaped me as profoundly as a gentleman named Mario, who turns 80 next year, is a longtime retired firefighter who likes to work on his Datsun in his spare time. Like there's nothing from the outside, you'd see nothing special about this man. But having, I ended up having to live with them for about two years. And what I discovered was day after day, I got to watch this man move peacefully through the world, loving people however and whenever he could, enjoying his friends and his family and being generous with young, energetic goofballs like me. He really, he embodied, there's a ver, famous verse in Romans 12 that says, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. That was Mario. Mario was the first person that I had seen, including, you know, many years of church attendance. He was the first person that I had seen that deliberately shaped his daily calendar around being with Jesus and loving people. And he never got on me or anybody else to do it. It was just who he was as a follower of Jesus. And to be clear, Mario's not perfect. Mario and I, Mario and I disagree on politics. Uh, Mario likes hunting. And like I said, he likes working on cars. I like reading and loud music. Like we, there, were, there are things that we didn't see eye to eye on. But the simplicity and the humility of his life changed mine because I got to watch somebody up close who is and will be celebrated in the kingdom. 
He is the vulnerable and the humble and the simple that show us who Jesus is and display for all of the world Jesus' way of life. So if I might give you a, a little bit of homework, I've got to ask, and, and I even want to backtrack for a second because I don't want to assume something. Mario uh, is near and dear to my heart. I mean, he's actually going to be here in a few weeks. He was one in a, I was pastoring in a church of uh, mostly old white conservative people. So it was mostly 60 to 100 old white conservative people. And I would not describe everybody in that church the way that I describe Mario. I love the people in that church. Mario is an exception. He's not the rule. So I say that to say this. Who in your life, who in your church, who in this Bible study, who displays the humility and the gentleness and the vulnerability that Jesus describes? And here's my homework for you. Find that person and be near them as much as you can. Because like Jesus showing them a child, we have those examples around us in God's kindness. And that brings me uh, to the last part of the text for today, which is really then just a launching pad for Jesus. So by all means, keep reading. Uh, but I'm going to read verse 6 again. Jesus says, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. <laughs> My man, Jesus. <laughs> uh, that is strong language that we almost we almost can't help but pay attention because it's so stark and even a little bit aggressive. But we know Jesus has been clear that the kingdom of his kingdom celebrates and protects the vulnerable and the humble. And we see it plainly. He doubles down here. He says that anybody who causes somebody like a Mario, the person in your life who's humble and vulnerable, whoever causes that kind of person to stumble, they'd be better off drowning which is a bold thing to say. I mean, it's hyperbole, but it's potent language. And Jesus uses it as a springboard uh, in verses 7 and 8, which I'm not going to read for right now. But verse 7 focuses on the world and the world imposing stumbling blocks. But then there's another famous verse about if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. And uh, that's where I want to focus to end because we tend, I think, to focus on external pressures that cause stumbling blocks as opposed to internal ones. And I want to, and I want to close our time looking inward again. Somebody I, I admire recently said, the vast majority of Christians are educated past their level of obedience. He says, if you would just do what you already know, your life would change. And he's right. And we see this uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. The primary enemy that we have to this way of Jesus is ourselves. And I don't want to let uh, church folk in particular off the hook on this. One of my least favorite trends within American Christianity broadly, and I'm going to sharpen the critique to, to me, one of my least favorite trends among American pastors is the infrequency with which we own our own mess. The problems we create, the bad decisions that we make. Part of the reason uh, that I began this, uh, this teaching with the illustration of the two pastors at a key time in my life is because we as Christians, I would argue, we are as susceptible as anybody to the question of who is the greatest. And we will build platforms and large churches and huge Bible studies potentially to buttress our commitment to who we believe is the best and the greatest. And the first pastor I mentioned, James, was a roaring success. 
by most mainstream standards. But in the end, he wounded thousands of people and did not consistently display the vulnerability and humility that Jesus does. And the second pastor I mentioned, Eric, was just making ends meet in a small town, faithfully loving people. We are often wrong. I am often wrong. Pastors are often wrong about which of these two things is more desirable. And as a result, we've been the one. I have been the one for whom Jesus would have these strong words. And so it's important to hear this from somebody who pastors. The kingdom, what we're about, prayerfully, celebrates and protects the vulnerable and the humble. And to land the plate on this uh, teaching, I'm at just about a half hour and then we'll open the floor. Um, to end the, this time, I want to double down on the Mario anecdotes because uh, he's just, he's a hero within my story. It's, he's God's kindness to me. When I went out there to work uh, in Denver at the time in student ministries, Mario was in his early to mid 70s. So he's not a spring chicken. And we had all of our student ministry shenanigans, you know, dodgeball fights, uh, trips to the sand dunes. Um, I could go on, you know, um, um, what are the lock-ins where you stay up all night, all, all the kind of things that you do when you're in student ministry. Guess who was consistently the first person who would sign up to be there? Yeah, Mario. Years later, as I was leading the church, so our church went through a lot of really hard times, uh, including our senior pastor having an affair with the choir director, and there's a whole story with that. So there was a stretch where I was leading this church, and there was a faction within the church that was really angry with the previous pastor and then with the transitional leadership team. Guess which one of our people uh, was willing to go sit with them at great length and listen and be present? Yeah, it was Mario, right? The kingdom celebrates and protects the vulnerable and the humble. So that's your homework. Who in your life, who has God given you? Where, what are the pictures around you of this true kind of vulnerability and humility? Um, and the question, so I'm going to close in prayer and then I'll open the floor. I'd actually love to hear from you on who is your Mario, if you have one. And I, who has displayed for you time and again the humility and the vulnerability that Jesus celebrates here with this child? All right, I'm going to pray and we'll open the floor. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that you're honest with us. Uh, thank you that you speak to some of America's idols. You really speak to all of them. But today you've reminded us that the pursuit of competition in comparison is not a universally good thing. In fact, it gets us into trouble. It gets pastors into trouble. And so we're thankful for the reminder of your vulnerability and your humility. And then we're reminded, we're so thankful of the reminder that you showed a child to these disciples. You give people like me, Mario, so that I can see in real time what humility and vulnerability looks like, just like this child. And so call to mind for each of us now uh, who you've brought in our lives. Uh, that has truly shown us this humility and vulnerability. We're so grateful for your word, and we ask that you'll uh, bless its reading and its teaching. In Jesus' name, amen. So yeah, that's your question. Who has God brought in your life as a Mario or as a little child like he did with these disciples? Okay, Joe. Yeah. Well, I, I would just, this is not an answer to that question. This is... But I, I, but I think, uh, you know, when, when they all said, who's the greatest, then John came back and told us, he said, well, I'm the one that Jesus loved. You know, I'm the disciple Jesus loved. Well, uh, uh, Jesus says, be like this child. So my question would be, what are the characteristics of a child? Uh, first of all, children are very inquisitive, aren't they? They try to learn something. And they're also told, be seen and not heard which confirms what you're just saying about 
Maybe the people who are doing the preaching are the most outstanding. People aren't the most delightful ones at all. I think about the uh, the crime that was committed just this, the other day in St. Louis, and the person who committed the crime said, I have no friends, I have no family, I have nobody that loves me, I have no nothing, and so he killed people. I mean, that's, I, I, I said to my wife, if, if I were in school with that person, I would have made an effort to be a friend to him, even though he was not very well accepted. And we all know when we were in school, there were cliques of people, everybody was in the clique and whatever else. But it would have been so wonderful if somebody just taken him under their wing and just said something, something to him a bit there. And um, well, that's that's more than I need to say. But but uh, I've always loved this when Jesus says, "Be like," and and he always uses these extremes. Whatever he's talking about, he always talks about extremes, and um, that's a extreme situation. And so, anyway, Brian, first of all, thank you for compelling teaching. I was kind of stunned. One of my father's favorite phrases that he taught me was, "Values are." caught and not taught. And so he said, you have to be careful. You know, you can say it, but it's the, your kids will catch it from you. The person that popped in my mind, though, uh, and he's, he's gone on to glory. His name was T. Ray. He went to church at Orange just up the road, a handyman, a very gruff exterior. One time he came to me and said, Rick, when your father dies, you're going to feel like an orphan. And he walked off. I thought, what a terrible thing to say. I mean, I was in my 40s. My dad was alive. When my dad died in 1999, I went back and said, I get it now. He said, I knew, I knew you would, but I want you to think about what it would be like when he was gone. Mm -hmm. He didn't have great uh, articulate skills, but one thing he did, he bought baseball cards at flea markets and put them in his pocket and told all the little boys in our church, if you learn the Bible verse, I'll give you a baseball card. And the bi biblical literacy of mostly boys <laughs> from six to 12. Yeah, my, my son went up and said, I got one from Matthew, Jesus wept. And he said, okay, smart guy, <laughs> you get only one card for that. But he, he had the most loving heart. He came to my house to do some work and he said, I'll do it if you will sit with me and help me. And those hours we sat together were such a blessing. And he once asked me, he said, I know you've read the Bible cover to cover. I've never done that. Would you do that with me? I said, it'd be an honor. And we That's awesome. went through a whole year and we would talk. He'd say, now I'm a chapter behind him. I'm going to catch up. But T, T. Ray exhibited exactly what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. And if I list the people that have assisted me in my walk, it wasn't because he had great theological insight. It was that I caught yeah. his love for Jesus. I love it. Yeah. Uh, just to double down on that, I'm relatively convinced. I, I could probably, I think I could get myself into trouble for saying this. Uh, I think the, the, the gentleman within vintage, which is the kind of family of churches I'm a part of that most embodies that this is the gentleman who does the, who works on the building. Uh, he, there's something about that. Yeah. I think it's, um, I'll give you one example. Mother Teresa is the, he, she, in her whole life, is working on the orphanage. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And he is the, she is the one who humbled the world. But before I want to talk about this humbling the world, I want to tell you the history when Jesus was there. That history is the most vicious cycle of the whole world. That is the Qing Dynasty of China, and is the Holy Roman em the, the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire is, yeah, the greatest. Mm -hmm. What in heaven, in hell. All the human being is killed. Look at all the Europe, okay? When Jesus was born, the whole Western world is in war. And in China, that's a Qi Huang Di. Okay. He's a hero. Okay. He should go to heaven, man. He's the one who kill off everybody. If you don't, be, don't follow me, kill, 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 kill. Okay. And that is when Jesus was there. Hmm. God, look at him. This is all the human being I made. They're killing each other. This in Europe, this in China. It happened right now. 
look at Ukraine and look at China right now. We're going to have facing another war. The war we fought, oh, this is in Taiwan. No. Biden said, oh, yeah, I'm going to send the army in Taiwan. Okay. Hey, wait a minute, Biden. Don't tell me that you send our kid and Taiwan and fight. And we don't know what to fight. Oh, yeah, because you fight for semiconductor. It's for your own sake. Okay. And you're going to go to heaven? For Christ's sake. Okay, stop this whole thing. Okay. Let's have peace. Appreciate that. Yeah. Well, your your original question was, "Who is your Mario?" Um, you're probably going to say this. Uh, you can't can't use this person, but it's actually for me. It's no. It's hands down. No other person in the world comes close. My wife. She. You can definitely use your wife. That's she, great. She is the most humble, low profile, self serving. If I if she were here and I asked her to say something, she would run out. She doesn't want the limelight. But she is always taking care when we have family over. She's making sure everybody's happy. Everybody's got what they want, the grandkids, everybody. She is just the most humble, by your description, Mario-like yeah. person that I have ever met. I love her so much. I told her one day, I said, if you ever leave me, I'm going with you. <laughs> Yeah, there's a there's a great line from uh, that reminds me of a, a comedian line that uh, he basically was like, without if my wife starts to die, I'm going to die so much faster than her. And that's what that makes me think of. Uh, I, I say 100 percent, just like John, my wife, she's out of sight. Wonderful. But I remember when we visited, some of us visited the Billy Graham Museum and there was a, an interview in there with James Baker, who was a big preacher in the early days and made tons of money and, and fell and went in the end up in jail. Yeah. Billy Graham visited him in jail. It was here. And I thought that is, that's what you call a Mario. That's a person who sees somebody who's, who's fallen by the wayside, but yet you go and forgive him. And I'm Baker said that was the greatest thing ever happened in his life. Really? Listen, by the way, I would say, I hope you come again. This has been wonderful. You've done Thank a great you. job. That's kind of you. Eric on zoom. Okay. You have a Zoom that would like to speak? Eric? Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, good afternoon, brothers. <clears throat> my first mentor in my life, <clears throat> 13 years old, was Jesus Christ. And that was the most profound thing in my life that I've carried on forever. Um, but my second mentor was a man called Napoleon Hill. Napoleon Hill was the father of positive mental attitude. And in the Bible, God wants us to live positivity in our life, to be a good example for him. And I've, um, I teach a leadership positive mental attitude. And I'm 78 years old. And Napoleon Hill, when I was 16 years old, asked me to make a promise. And that promise is, Eric, I want you to pass on positive mental attitude the rest of your life. And at 78, I teach two days a week. And I have a lot of scriptures to back up what I teach, because what I teach is God's word. It's just that I put it in a different frame set. Because God wants me to be a good example. And that's what I've become. And my mission in life is to save others for salvation in the Lord. And that's what I feel about my brothers here, is you're on a mission. I don't believe in sin anymore because Almighty Jesus died on the cross to save us of that. Sin to me is the negative. All negatives in my life I turn into positivity. Positive reinforcement. So I rid myself of sin. I'm not perfect. The only person that was perfect was Jesus Christ and the most magnificent mind ever. I don't compare myself to anybody. I just try to my, live my life to be a good example for the Lord. Amen.
while um, Eric was talking, I just wanted to remind you, um, Eric, he's 78, and he walked outside and saw a bull mastiff. If you've ever seen a bull mastiff, I looked them up. They're big, mean, muscular dogs. Was on, uh, I don't know, a, a, a two or three, four year old kid, and was uh, chew, trying to chew his chew his face off. And he ran. He knew that. He knew that he was it was going to take everything that he and the Holy Spirit could do. And he went over and just beat the living tar out of the dog and saved the child. And um, I guess he broke some dog's bones. I called him later and asked him, uh, you know, of course, they put the dog down. But it chewed the child's mouth off and uh, the child's going through a lot of reconstructive things. But the child was saved because Eric took a very, very dangerous charge and said, I'm going to fight to the death to save that child. And I, I really admire, I admire what you did, Eric. I admire it a lot. Well, God gave me the strength because I have strength so powerful um, because I was an Olympic coach. I was a real Olympic wrestler in the Hall of Fame. And I always waited for a day that I would have to call on the Lord for more strength than I had. And that's the thing that worked for me was I always turned to Jesus for more strength. And you couldn't ask for more strength than from the Lord. Amen. Amen. And I would tell you guys, look up a picture of a bull mastiff when you get home and see what he did. All right. Fred, Fred's clicking off. Willie, thanks for joining us today. You know, it's the first time I've seen you with the camera on. Uh, you're kind of backlit, but, uh, you know, that might be the best you've ever looked. <laughs> Can I, do you mind if I just close this out in prayer? I don't know. Are you all right? Okay. All right. I'm going to pray for us. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for friends. Thank you for food. Thank you for your scriptures. Thank you that you love us. We're so grateful that we get to do this. Uh, we ask that you would uh, meet with us uh, in the rest of our day. To, uh, use this word uh, to equip us as we go, uh, to, to live humbly and vulnerably, to see you in the lives of others around us, uh, and help us to love this place well. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, yeah. Let me say this one last thing. Um, I just want to remind everybody that tomorrow is celebrates the second anniversary of, of uh, Albert Long's passing. So um, just as a reminder. So uh, if anybody wants to reach out to his widow or uh, uh, are just... Um, be in prayer for his family. It'll be a, the second anniversary of his Albert Long's passing. Okay. God bless you. <laughs>